I would like to introduce Dr. Phil and Captain Polly. They want to talk to you about cyber hijacking airplanes. Tell us, is it truth or fiction? I guess you'll find out. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming. Hopefully, if our talk sucks, the next one doesn't, and you can just stay here and have a good seat. That's, that was my plan for my talk yesterday. But as I said, I'm Dr. Phil, and this is Captain Polly. Just a little bit, why, why this talk? Well, you know, there's a lot of people who have been talking about being able to take over planes remotely and, and such, and of course, when you say things like that, you get a lot of press. And so we just thought maybe it was time to investigate some of these things and look at them a little further. Um, and it's okay to be scared, but if you're going to be scared, be scared because of reality, you know, because of some fiction, maybe some stuff that the media has made you think. All right, so. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, some of you may know me as a hardware hacker. Uh, wrote a book, which I'm shamelessly plugging by putting, putting my uh, cover as a background for this slide. But uh, anyway, uh, but in addition to that, I also am an aviator. I have 12 aviation ratings. They're all current, including a commercial pilot, flight instructor, airplane mechanic, inspection authorization holder, avionics technician, a couple others. I have thousands of hours of flight time. Also aircraft builder. And importantly for our talk today, I've actually done some development and testing work on some of the avionics that you would find in some of these modern airliners. I also have access to manuals, current and former airline pilots, i.e. Captain Polly and others. <laughs> and that's about me. So I'm Captain Polly. I'm currently an associate professor at a college, um, University of Dubuque, that has a, a flight program that trains University pilots. University Redacted. <laughs> Redact, yes, okay. Um, but my background while I'm here is to, to give you the perspective of the commercial airline pilot training, um, how we train, and um, safety in mind. All right. So a little bit about what we want to talk about today. Uh, we wanted to talk about Things like ADS-B, uh, you may have heard of it, ADS-A, it's kind of similar but different. Uh, ACARs, transponders, collision avoidance systems, how do they work? Uh, a little bit about GPS, you guys already know about GPS, but uh, autopilots, some avionics buses and networks, and some attacks that you may have heard about. So you may have heard about people saying, ah, okay, I can attack your airplane, take it over by hacking into the avi avionics network via in-flight Wi-Fi or the entertainment network. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and examine, you know, is that true, is it not true, or is it kind of true? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ADS-B hacking, also talk about things like engine system monitors, uh, a cars, what it is, how you might be able to exploit it, etc. All right. So let me get this out of the way to start with. All right. One thing that everyone needs to understand: you cannot override the pilot. All right. You cannot override the pilot's inputs on flight controls. Right. That system is closed, you know, even if it's fly-by-wire, uh, believe it or not, some of these airliners still use cables for some of the controls. For example, the Embraer Regional Jet actually uses cables for the elevator controls. Um, so it's not even fly-by-wire completely. But um, also something you should understand is that all of these airplanes do feature mechanical backup instruments. Now, I'm not going to say that the pilots still know how to use them. I'm just going to say that they're there. All right? Nice. So, you know, you can't really hack a mechanical altimeter or, or attitude indicator, et cetera, et cetera. All right? Um, I said you can, but I should have said you may be able to affect the autopilot operation. But then again, you need to realize 
If the pilots notice what's going on, they will disconnect the autopilot. And Polly can tell you there's at least nine different ways to do that. Um, in addition to that, uh, you can overpower the autopilot and there are limits on what's allowed for certified aircraft. So for example, if you have an airline pilot that's a size zero model and she moonlights as an airline captain, she can still throw all of her 90 pounds on that control yoke and overpower the autopilot, right? Also, you should realize that if you try to do something to hack into the autopilot, you're most likely going to generate some sort of alert that, again, hopefully pilots would notice. So. All right, a little bit of background talking about avionics networks. The, in the olden times, people used something called Air Inc. 429, which is a standard for interconnecting avionics systems. Um, in the bottom corner, you'll see a little picture of a PCM CIA card that says 429 on it. And this is something that you could use on a laptop if you're going to test a piece of avionics that uses Air Inc. 429. Uh, by the way, today we're going to talk about a lot of Air Inc. standards. It's a really old company that's been doing stuff in aviation, and they've developed all these standards that everybody uses. So. You'll see that a lot. Um, now, Airing 429 is not really connected to anything useful for our purposes, uh, and it requires some specialized hardware. And so people said, you know, buying proprietary stuff so you could test all these avionics is kind of a pain in the butt. So let's do something better. Let's do something that's based on COTS, common off the shelf stuff. And that's where we get into our discussion of Air Inc. 664, which in certain airplanes, basically if it's an Airbus, uh, they call it AFDX. That's essentially the same thing. All right. So what is this AFDX or Air Inc. 664? Technically, it's 664 part 7 networking, but nobody cares. All right. Um, it's built on Ethernet. But you can't just start sending packets. You know, it's like saying, I have a video cassette. Can you, can you play it? Sure I can. Oh, it's Betamax. And it's PAL. So, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, it's the same but different. Uh, something you should know, it is never wireless. All right. These avionics networks are never wireless networks. They do have some security in place. Um, they're not connected to things like the entertainment system, and they're not connected to anything wireless. Right. All right. So Air Inc. 664, or AFDX, is something that was based on Air Inc. 629. You know, 629 is kind of like 429, but different, right? Um, and the 629 was first found in the Boeing 777 and pretty much that's the only place you'll see it. Nobody else uses it. It's only found in that one aircraft. Uh, Boeing's going on like the 787 uh, uses 664 instead. But as I said before, this allows you to use your nice common off-the-shelf components so that it's easier to find chips and things in order to build your avionics built on Ethernet, but not the same thing. Uh, one of the big differences that you'll find with this is that it uses two redundant channels, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. And also, it assigns time slices to avoid collisions and to make things deterministic. All right? You know, Ethernet's great, and we all understand it. We all understand how to use it. But one of the issues for this case of using straight up Ethernet is that you don't know how long it's going to take for your packets to arrive. And that's a problem if you're trying to do something like move a flight control. Right. Also in the Air Inc. 664 standard is this idea of virtual links. So essentially what you can do is you can have multiple links on the same wires. And each of these links is a unidirectional logical pipe. Every one of them has one and only one sender 
and one or more receivers. Right? And as I said, you have some time slicing that's done to avoid collisions, and you have to decide how much bandwidth you want to assign to each of these pipes. You know, there's only so much bandwidth on the wire, uh, and if you have multiple things that are going to be used, you have to decide, all right, I'm going to use this much bandwidth for whatever, uh, playing music, downloading music over eight cars. No, you can't really do that. But, um, and then there's also the idea of jitter. Jitter is just the maximum difference in timing for those packets to arrive. And it's based on things such as uh, how many virtual links are on the wire and what the bandwidth is assigned to each of them. All right, so a connection on AFDX would look kind of like this on the left. Oh, hopefully that's not fuzzy. It's a little fuzzy in my monitor up here, but um, you have a couple of pieces of avionics and each of them has two Ethernet adapters, an A channel and a B channel. Um, and logically, you have kind of the NIC, if you will, inside each of these avionics pieces. And they have these two channels, but logically, inside the avionics, it looks like just one Ethernet channel. And in order to connect to, uh, oh, I think we might might have a brief pause here. No, no, no keep going. Okay. Um, as I was saying, in order to security alert, Captain Polly's <laughs> looking worried. <laughs> uh, security to the. Oh, what, never mind. What does any of this mean? <laughs> Go ahead. What does anything mean? All right. So. Um, one thing you should realize is that there always needs to be an avionics switch of some sort. No, 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 no. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. I didn't mean. I mean, you should have run these by me before you started speaking. But nothing can be done about that now. It's not my oh. first time. <laughs> Give me that. Oh, oh, oh! You know what? Second time Goon speakers, spilling Jack booze Daniels on the speaker. Spread across them like a baptism. All right. Raise your hand if you're a first time speaker. <laughs> All right. Let's <laughs> go. Okay. Such a good captain example. <laughs> Thanks for that, mm. by the way. Thank All you. All right. Now we can't fly for eight hours. I have eight now. hours at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, All right, Kathy. so as I was saying, the, uh, Thank you. Thanks. there's no equivalent to a crossover cable in these situations. Pretty much you're going to have to go through an avionics switch, even if you have just two pieces of avionics, which you, you would never have that situation anyway. Um, but looking a little bit at airing 60, 664 in real life, um, this is a partial diagram for a undisclosed airliner. And you'll notice that some of the links are highlighted in yellow. And those are the two-way links. Right? So those are the 664 links between the flight management system, uh, some flight computers, and some other stuff. Um, and if you don't think this is pretty tightly integrated, this next picture will kind of give you an idea that, and again, this is only a partial diagram from some unknown airliner. Um, and you'll see that there's quite a bit of data flowing around on these buses. Now, the other thing you should realize, um, the number of 664 networks varies from one aircraft to the next. Some of these networks are twisted pairs, some of them are fi fiber, some of them are coax even. Um, all of these are allowed and they interoperate and typically these switches will translate between the different media formats and, and such. All right. Let's talk about entertainment systems. Right. Uh, a lot of talk has 
been about, about these entertainment systems. Um, if you look at the in-seat displays and you see, oh, this is where we're going, this is where we've been kind of thing, um, nice little maps, something pretty to watch. Of course, if you're flying on someone like Spirit, well, they don't even have that. But if they did, I'm sure there'd be a credit card reader to see where you are. <laughs> I'm, I really wait. I flew out on Spirit. I'm waiting for them to have a credit card reader for the toilet paper in the lab. You know, you know, you just better hold it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's connected to output ports on the GPS and FMS, the flight management system, or through something called a NED, a network extension device. So we'll talk more about those in a bit. Um, one thing you should realize though, these are never connected to that Air Inc. 429, 629, or 664 network. All right. there's, there's no reason for this to be connected. Um, and also remember, it's never wireless and it's not compatible with your everyday friendly TCP IP. And you might wonder why do I have a picture of a VGA port? Um, and just to kind of emphasize the point, this is an output that it's connected to. So, you know, trying to hack it and trying to get to the FMS th through this avenue is kind of like trying to hack into your computer through the VGA port. You know, it's, you can send signals there, but if nobody's listening, nobody's listening. All right. All right. Um, here's a, a picture of one example in-flight entertainment system. You can see kind of how it's connected and there's a server that serves up stuff to the passengers, et cetera, et cetera. And down in the corner is a picture of one commercially available in-flight entertainment system. All right. I want to talk a little bit about the 777. There's been some confusion around the 777 in particular uh, because of a little flight, uh, anyone heard of, uh, what is it, Malay Malaysian 370. Air 370? Anyone heard anything about that? Okay. All right, so there's been a lot of confusion around this. Uh, and here's what the situation is. All right, so Boeing went to the FAA and they asked them for a special condition to allow passenger information network uh, to get some sort of connection to networks such as the Aircraft Information Network. Right. So in November of last year, FAA granted them a special condition which basically said, okay, you may now do this, that provided that they could use one of these NEDs, network extension devices, um, as long as they met certain conditions. Right. So what are those certain conditions, those special conditions? This is what they said. The applicant must ensure that the design provides isolation from or aircraft, airplane electronic system security protection against access by, you know, bad people, basically. All right. Um, and that's where the NED comes in. All right. So the NED is a gateway, and essentially what it does is it translates whatever protocol is being used on the avionics buses, be it Air Inc. 429, 629, or 664, into IP, you know, basically into something that everybody else understands. Right? So like any gateway, each of these pathways has to get programmed. Right? So that's one thing you need to realize. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to send stuff through this gateway. Again, um, even if you could send something through this gateway, if nobody's listening, nobody's listening. You know, it's like the tree that falls in the forest. Do you still have to pay taxes on it? Um, <laughs> so the other thing you need to realize is that the FMS does not receive any inputs from the NED. You know, it might output information such as where's the plane now, where's the plane going, to the NED, um, so you can't send bogus commands to an FMS through this NED because it doesn't listen for commands from the NED. Um, now I will say this, a, a possible attack vector, if you did compromise the NED, you might be able to impersonate another device 
that the FMS does listen to. All right, so I, I'm never going to say that everything is impossible. I'm just trying to say that um, you can't compromise the net and talk directly to the FMS. You might be able to fake it out a little bit, um, but again, in the end, you got the pilots there to protect you from weird stuff, and hopefully they pay attention. Don't fall asleep, overfly the airport, because that's whiskey. never happened. <laughs> exactly. All right, um, here's an example, Ned, which I shamelessly took off of Teledyne Control's website without permission, but hey, it's out there. Um, and from here, you can see that the, the black lines, in this case, it's an Air Inc. 429 Ned. Uh, you can see a black line coming from the FMS to the Ned, but you do not see any corresponding return path to the FMS. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Malaysia 370, right? What was this plane? Well, it was a 777, right? A 777 uses Air Inc. 629, and as we said, um, it's not the same. I mean, it's a 777. They're the only ones that ever used 629. So it's not really the 664 that we've been talking about mostly. So it, you know, it's not Ethernet. It's really not Ethernet. All right, it's not as close to Ethernet that you're used to as 664. Um, so, because this is the only plane that uses 629, and because it's really not Ethernet, it's even further away, um, that makes it a little bit harder to hack. Um, I realize it's somewhat security through obscurity, but yeah, it, I'm not saying it's impossible, nothing's impossible, but um, it's a lot harder. So. And I'll let Polly talk about this next slide here. So uh, Dr. Phil thought since I was the newbie, you guys might give me a few less jeers than you would him, uh, booze. So we really did try hard. We thought we were close, um, but for proprietary reasons, um, we weren't able to get any of the manufacturers to share their goodies. So what we did, what we have is even better for you. Um, we have, we're going to move from schematics to dramatics, um, and we have a, just a movie clip of what this might look like if passengers in the back were trying to hack into the in-flight wireless uh, entertainment system. Hello, and welcome to How to Hack Into and Take Control of the <laughs> Step 1. When trying to get access to the plane's navigation system, try to utilize the plane's in-flight entertainment system. This is near to impossible, but with enough typing and counter buzzwords, such as I'm in and rerouted the network interface. Also, I got in the router girder. Yeah! <laughs> you can make it seem like the in flight entertainment and navigation systems are connected and thus frighten an air marshal enough to incapacitate you. With enough hacking, one could be able to sign onto the plane's Wi-Fi for free. He's <laughs> still. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> and just by the way, uh, all the actors were pilots. <laughs> no real tasers were used. No pilots were harmed in the filming of that. <laughs> all right. And, you know, that was meant to be a bit humorous, so hopefully you found it so. But also, you know, just to reinforce the point, the in-flight wireless is not connected in any meaningful way to these systems. So, you know, good luck trying to get in that way. But, all right, I want to shift gears a little bit, talk a little bit about ADS-B and ADS-A. Um, some of the things that you can do. Uh, ADS-B is a pretty well-known protocol. You know, there's been some other talks about it. Uh, if you look at the slide down in the bottom left, you'll see a board that you can use to receive, decode ADS-B signals, even send your own. And on the right 
is a commercial unit that you might find in a small aircraft that's a GPS slash ADSB unit for receiving and sending ADSB signals. Actually, I think that one only receives ADSB. But um, as others have said, it's true. There's no security in this protocol. Uh, you can create phantom aircraft. You can create bogus ADSB transmissions all day long. Uh, you could even create fake weather reports if you so choose. Or if you're just really frustrated, you could always jam it. You know, you can jam any frequency. Um, however, as we're going to talk about in a bit, it's not likely to an affect any kind of t traffic or collision avoidance system. And there are some reasons for that. But, all right, so a little bit more about ADSB. ADSB is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. That's what the B is for. And this was piloted in Alaska. And it was an intended to improve s s the situation where there's not a lot of radar coverage. You know, Alaska is a very, very large state, and it's not very populous. Right? Uh, this is part of a long-term goal for a system that's known as free flight that's planned for the future. And the idea is that eventually aircraft would be able to kind of negotiate with each other in order to avoid collisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can provide traffic and weather in places where that's available. And it's used by small planes to broadcast their positions. Up the corner up the corner picture is actually of an ADSB out unit. This is something that's been mandated by the FAA for small aircraft to have by 2020. 2020. 2020, mm -hmm. 2020 yes. Um, all right. Now, there is something similar but different to ADS-B. It's called ADS-A. All right. And you, you might hear people talk about ADS-B. One thing you need to realize is the airlines use ADS-A. Right. Uh, this is related to the ACAR system we're going to talk about as well. Um, and it's like this. ADS-B is kind of like a cable-ready TV, and ADS-A is a cable box. All right. It's addressable, so you can do things like pay-per-view movies for the cable box. But for ADS-A, it allows specific aircraft to send and receive messages, and it allows lower separation outside of radar coverage through a system called FANS, the Future Air Navigation System. And essentially what this means, if you look at an airliner that's flying over the ocean, uh, in times past, the separation between airliners was fairly large because they're over the ocean and there's no radar coverage. With something like FANS reporting their position, through ADS-A, which, by the way, is sometimes called ADS-C for, uh, gosh, I just forgot what, but you can look it up. All right. Um, it will report into the fan system, and that allows them to be a little bit closer, which means more traffic going through, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other, another thing you should realize is that airliners use neither ADS-B or ADS-A for collision avoidance. They do other stuff. Um, other things about the transmissions, ADS-A transmissions and also the ACARS transmissions, they can either be VHF, HF, or satellite. And it really depends on where they are. You know, if you're over land and over the United States, it's probably VHF. If you're over Europe, it might be HF. Or if you're over the Arctic, it might be HF. And if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's probably satellite, all right? And they selectively choose which media they're going to use based on things like cost and speed. All right, so collision avoidance. When you look at collision avoidance systems in primarily small aircraft, you might see something called TIS-B, Traffic Information Service B. And this is a service that's provided by air traffic control and it requires you to have either a mode S transponder or ADS-B in. And sometimes you have both of those things. Um, it's only available in some areas. It's also not authoritative. And what that means, if you're flying along in a plane equipped with TIS-B 
and air traffic control says, hey, you have traffic at your one o'clock, two miles, you can't say, I have the traffic, unless you can physically see them. All right, so it's not an authoritative system. Uh, the other important thing to know is that this does not use the ADSB signals from others. Right? Um, and ATC does not automatically relay every ADSB signal they receive. Right? So we talked earlier about the fact that you can, uh, you can very easily take a board and you can generate ADSB messages and send them out. The problem with that is those signals are probably going to get ignored. If there's not a corresponding radar blip somewhere that corresponds to that aircraft, most likely ATC is going to ignore that transmission. Also, again, they're not going to pick up that transmission, so they're not going to send it to somebody else who might be running TISB in their aircraft. Right? Other kinds of collision avoidance. Uh, some of the small planes use something called TCAD. I think they named it this because it sounds kind of like TCAS, and they thought you would give them more money for their stuff. Um, and it provides some information. Again, it's not authoritative. And what TCAD does is it essentially just listens for transponders around it. And then it goes, hey, I heard a transponder over here. Don't go over there, right? Or, you know, it gives you some sort of indication as to traffic around you. Now, the big boys, BizJets and Upward, they have something called TCAS, all right? So let's talk about TCAS. By the way, just backing up here a second. The display on the bottom is a TCAS display. Uh, sometimes people call it the fish finder. It, you know, you'll hear people say, I got them on the fish finder. Uh, sometimes incorrectly, pilots, especially if their name is Joe. That's a little <laughs> private joke with me and Polly. But, um, <laughs> We'll, we'll say, I have them on the fish finder. They don't have a fish finder. And that's not legal for them to call it traffic. But all right, TCAS. Um, what does TCAS do? It uses the transponders around it. And unlike TCAD and these other systems, it can actively interrogate other transponders. Right? So if you ever look at a radar system, you see the big, typically red uh, parabolic antenna that's rotating. On top of that, you might see another antenna array, often painted white, and that antenna array on the top is sending out another signal, and then transponders are responding back to it. And they're saying, oh, I'm over here, and we'll talk a little bit about them in just a second. But a TCAS system can actively query other transponders. And so how this works, like for example, if I'm sitting at the airport ready to take off and a biz jet or larger comes in to land, I can look at my transponder and I will see the reply light continuously illuminated, indicating that somebody keeps pinging my transponder. Right? Now, this is an authoritative system, which means they do not have to actually physically see you to say that they have you as traffic. Um, and that's a good thing. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see, but down in the corner, you see an example of what we call an RA, a resolution um, alert? Advisory. Advisory, Advisory. yeah. Um, and it, it says in red, traffic, traffic, and then it has some information. In addition to this, you'll have a nice, lovely voice in the <laughs> cockpit also telling you traffic, traffic, and in some cases, a recommended action as well, right. if they're really close. And the voice does get more and more excited the closer the traffic gets. Yeah. Is it a sexy voice? Uh, I don't find it extremely sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know um, military aircraft, they actually like to use female voices because they found that military pilots respond better. Maybe they're used to listening to their mom. So one of my friends uh, did some work on an undisclosed fighter plane. And he did some work on the system known as Bitching Betty. <laughs> and Bitching Betty would just tell you all about your fuel situation and how you needed to go back before you <laughs> ran out of gas and land in the ocean. 
All right, so transponders, uh, here I got a couple of examples. Up in the top is an example transponder off of a Boeing, I think 737, but don't quote me. And in the bottom we have a couple of general aviation transponders. On the left we have a nice one from Garmin with a digital display. And if any of you are pilots in the room, you've probably seen the old school ones with the little twisty knobs on the right. All right. And these have different modes of operation. The most basic mode is called mode A. And in mode A, uh, what happens is it will uh, send out a ping and you'll respond and you'll give them that code on the front. By the way, they actually are the only people that I know of that use octal. So that's an octal system. So those, each of those numbers goes up to seven. So it's a 4096 code transponder. Um, all right, so there's also the ability to send your altitude, which is what we call mode C, and then there's mode S, which is the selective system. The other thing you should know is that airliners have at least two of these by regulation. They must. And I'll turn it over to Polly here. Okay, so um, this next clip is just going to show you um, that attacking ADSB may possibly be harassing, but I'm going to let it speak for itself here. Force the plane to reroute to another location, or at least harass the flight crew. Simply have your pilot friends fly multiple planes in front, behind, and around the plane you would like. Have said plane send thief transponder signals to the hijacked plane and force it to react to resolution advisories. The crew may possibly reroute to another location. In actuality, here's what would happen. ADSB attack. You know, technically that was two kinds of attacks. You know, yes, you could, again, you could attack the collision avoidance systems, but because they use directional antennas in an array, um, you can't just beam signals at them, right? You can't beam ADSB signals, transponder replies, or whatever at them. Um, you would have to beam signals from multiple directions, and it'd be fairly complicated. And if the plane that you're trying to target is a lot faster than your friend's plane, it's going to be pretty challenging. Like the Lego plane would have a really hard time keeping on. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Luke Skywalker has <laughs> got R2-D2 helping oh, him out, though. So, you know, maybe he'd be okay. <laughs> All right. And kind of our last topic, we're going to talk a little bit about ACARs and such, but um, engine systems, uh, again, engine monitors and such might be hooked up to this ACAR system. And you may have heard things about the 370 flight, people saying, well, there were um, these pings, right? These pings that were coming on after the plane had disappeared. And I believe what they're probably talking about are these ICARS messages. And the way that this is normally set up, uh, a lot of the systems in the plane will send messages back home either to the manufacturer and or the airlines just giving them status information. By the way, there's also some boring stuff that comes across a cars like, hey, the lab's broken, you know, stuff like that. Um, Stop by company for a drug test after you land. That's another yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, that's not a fun one. And you know, especially if you just had a shot. A shot, at, yeah, it'd be bad. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> all right, so some engine control systems, um, you know, people have talked about, well, could I hack into the engine control systems? One thing you need to realize about the engine control systems is that all of them have a purely mechanical backup, and in most cases, the controls themselves are actually mechanical, 
with an electronic system that's used to trim it. Um, this is kind of a general theme in aviation and that you know we always like to have things that are safe, not necessarily the most efficient. So the idea is that if the electronic system were to fail, the engines continue to operate, just not with perhaps maximum efficiency. All right, so ACARS is a system that's used to send messages to and from the ground. Um, it can be to and from people or systems and it's used to send things like weather information, uh, delays, updated flight plans, maintenance information, as we just said. Uh, and here in the pictures, you see a display with an ACARS message, and then there's always a printer, like a little ticker tape. So if you look at the bottom picture in the corner, you'll notice a little printer between the pilots that will print out all these ACARS messages that come along. Um, now, you could create a bogus flight plan update. Um, you could create bogus weather. Uh, I know that uh, there was a talk recently, last couple of days, uh, talking about some SATCOM systems that have some vulnerabilities, and those surely exist, and it is certainly true that you could send out bogus ACARS messages. You know, the real question that you have to answer is, what will happen as a result of those messages, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, and in my opinion, I'd say that it's not a very practical way to take over an airplane. Uh, and here, in the picture, you just have an engine display from an airliner, and what you'll notice, again, you know, there's an output of status information, and the, the period varies depending on the system and the aircraft, you know, but say every hour or so might be typical information that's sent uh, when it comes to status information on the engines and such. Um, and then when they're on the ground, there's additional information that can be downloaded for more maintenance purposes. So cybersecurity experts and airline pilots have very much in common uh, threat mitigation. There's multiple levels of safety, and one that you're about to see here. Um, every airline flight that's in progress has uh, a company dispatcher that's behind them that they can communicate with. Um, and pilots are supposed to ask themselves, does this seem reasonable? Um, does this make sense? They do a gut check. So the video you're going to watch... She must have had a big shot because she just went the wrong I, way in the press. Went, yeah. <laughs> so the video you'll see here, um, it's... Pilots catching that, that just doesn't make sense. Let's check on this. From no, the ground, no, no, no. one may be able to take control of the flight's ACARS message, where a crew receives flight plan modifications and ATC clearances. Hijacking an airplane is very serious and highly illegal and requires a specific set of circumstances that are very, very difficult to arrange. There'll be no cigars today, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was going to say, you know, Polly went backwards on the slides. That's why that's that eight hour rule, you know. <laughs> Okay, just some uh, closing thoughts. Um, nearly every protocol that's used in aviation is unsecured. You know, there's no encryption on A cars, there's no encryption on ADSB. By the way, uh, we didn't mention it, but one of the things that you'll see sometimes come across A cars are things like passenger lists. Um, so, not very private. 
but anyway. Um, and there certainly is a lot of potential to annoy ATC uh, and or small aircraft. And you know, there's an increasing level of automation with these unsecured protocols in place. And you know, this potentially could be problematic and definitely something that uh, we should continue to be aware of as that level of automation increases. Uh, however, thankfully, there are a lot of checks and balances. In, in the case of airlines, we have two pilots on every aircraft. So we have two humans kind of in the mix um, that will hopefully keep us safe. And, you know, for now, I think we're pretty safe. I feel pretty safe flying airliners. I don't have a problem flying them, taking my children, et cetera. Um, anyway, um, if you have any questions, you know, come, come see us later. Uh, hit us up on Twitter. I'm just P. Polster. I'm not very inventive. And Captain Polly, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Great job.